Good evening, this is News.ph, but it's not politics as usual. I'm Pia Ontiveros. It's Holy Wednesday, so we digress from the usual. We have an interview with a Vatican journalist on the occasion of Pope Francis's first year in office and a special report series on the Catholic Church in the Philippines. Vatican journalist John Allen Jr. was in the country last month as a guest of the Divine Word Seminary for its 50th anniversary. We sat down with Allen to talk about the first year of a rock star pope whose phenomenal rise to the papacy has still kept him humble, a very clear message he has sent out to the rest of the world about what the Catholic Church must be. We also talked about the church as it is brought to life by millions of Filipino migrants all over the world and we talked about Manila Archbishop Luis Antonio Cardinal Tagle, what he is to us and the rest of the world. Thank you for agreeing to do this interview, John. Did, did you see it coming, uh, Cardinal Bergoglio as uh, the next pope, new pope? Well, you know, Time Magazine <laughs> called me the guy who picked the pope because I did 22 <laughs> profiles of papal candidates and Bergoglio yeah. was one of them. So mm -hmm. if that's what picking the pope means, I suppose it's true. But no, I mean, the truth of it is, for me, like for most so-called experts, uh, you know, Bergoglio was in the mix. You had to mm -hmm. take him seriously because he had been the runner-up eight years before. Uh, but he was a B or C list candidate. Most of us thought he was too obscure, too old, and that his moment had passed. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it was a... Listen, I would say it was not stunning. He was certainly somebody that we had our eyes on, but it certainly was a surprise. What was the initial reaction like when um, his name was announced and in the days that followed... Um, that he was uh, the next pope, you know, was it like horrors, a Jesuit, or, you know, you know, were there things like that that come up? Well, honestly, you know, when the Habemus Papam announcement was made, that is the announcement of yes. the new pope, I, I don't think the initial reaction was to the name Bergoglio. I actually think the initial reaction was to the name Francis, mm -hmm. because that was in some ways a truly astonishing choice. I mean, aside from the fact that I had interviewed church historians in the past who had sworn until they were blue in the face that there could never be a Pope Francis. Because they would argue that just as there could never be a Pope Jesus or another Pope Peter, because these are singular and unrepeatable figures. So mm -hmm. it, was, it was surprising on that level. But even more, I mean, that, you know, when, when you take the name Francis, you are setting the bar awfully high for yourself. I mean, mm -hmm. Francis is an iconic figure in the Catholic imagination, the great Pope of the poor, the great Pope of peace, the great yeah. Pope of all, or not Pope, not obviously, pope, but yeah. the great saint yeah. uh, of the poor of peace of all creation. Mm -hmm. uh, you better be able to walk the talk. Uh, mm -hmm. And so it was a pretty bold selection. It was, in effect, a whole program of governance in miniature. So I think the initial reaction was simply to how breathtaking it was that, that some pope had, had set himself up uh, in that mm -hmm. way. And in one story, once remember, that's the first decision yeah. a pope ever makes, uh, is right. what name to Twice take. Name. Uh, and in that first uh, decision, in effect, Francis gave you the entire blueprint for his papacy. I think after that, that then we started to really ask the question, who is this man that, mm. that had the courage uh, and the boldness you know, to take this name for himself. And that's when we begin delving into the background of Jorge Mario Bergoglio. It's not as if the fact he was a Jesuit, you know, was mm. somehow a miraculous discovery that had been buried under a pile of rubble. But it uh, was for us in this part of the world. Well, yeah. sure. And, of course, yeah. it was quite remarkable because, you know, the, the Jesuits are not only a very well-known and large religious order, but they are, at times, a little bit polarizing. People have a lot of opinions. <laughs> polarizing, uh, yeah, huh? about, yeah. You know, I mean, people yeah. have a lot of different views of the Jesuits. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 you know, and then in the days to come, we discovered other things about Bergoglio. I mean, for example... Uh, you know, his background is a real sort of bishop of the poor uh, mm -hmm. in Argentina. I mean, we discovered that he didn't live in the archbishop's residence for the 15 years he was there. He lived in a Spartan Small apartment, apartment downtown. And when I say Spartan, I don't mean this euphemistically. It was the kind of place where he had to leave the stove on mm -hmm. on weekends during the winter because the building could not afford central heat. Okay, that's mm -hmm. where he chose to live, that he spent so, a great deal of his time. Uh, in the vicious miserias, the villas of misery, the slumps, uh, where the poorest of the poor in Argentina mm -hmm. live. 
the new pope did a masterful job of rounding out the picture for himself because within a very brief arc of time, and we're talking 48 hours, you know, he had already created a narrative for himself as a kind of maverick pope of the people and pope of the poor. Mm -hmm. The one who would make his own phone calls, pay his own bills. Yeah, I'm actually kind of irritated because I'm the last guy I know who has not gotten a phone call from Pope Francis. Yeah, I, I, mean, was, this, I was about to ask you that. This pope was legendary for working the phone, uh, uh, and he does yeah. work his own phone. I think he's probably the first pope in history who's actually made his own cell phone calls. Yeah. Uh, and, and as you say, I mean, you know, on and on. I mean, his decision to spurn the cavernous paper apartment and to stay in room 201 of the Doma Santa Marta, the hotel mm -hmm. on Vatican grounds where mm -hmm. he lived during the conclave, to go back to the Casa del Clero, which is a kind of a hotel for priests yeah. in Rome, and pack his own bag and pay his own bill. You know, calling his newspaper delivery guy in Buenos Aires and saying, yeah. hey, I'm not going to need the paper anymore. I mean, what all of this told us uh, is that, yeah, he may have reached the world's loftiest spiritual office, but he mm -hmm. remains an ordinary guy who is not drunk on his own image or his own power. Mm -hmm. So he came at the right time for the church. Well, would you I, say that? I, I would say that Francis came along at a moment when the Catholic Church, in many ways, at least in the court of public opinion, was at a low ebb. Mm -hmm. I mean, at the end of the Benedict years, the dominant narratives about the Catholic Church in, in your business and my business, the media business, the dominant storylines, uh, were child sexual abuse scandals mm -hmm. and Vatican meltdowns, crisis at the Vatican Bank, is there a gay lobby in the Vatican? you know, crackdowns on nuns, problems with women, bruising political fights, and on and on. And look, I mean, those stories obviously haven't gone away, yeah. but that is no longer the dominant narrative about the Catholic Church and the global media. The dominant narrative today is rock star pope takes the world by storm. Mm -hmm. uh, and in that sense, Francis clearly has given the church a, a new lease on life. Mm -hmm. And that's why we see him, like, uh, embracing a disfigured man, um, uh, inviting priests to hop onto the Pope Mobile, you know, doing things, that, you know, holding impromptu press conferences with journalists in flight, you know. I mean, he, he's doing everything that we never thought a Pope would do. We could add, you know, going to a youth prison in Rome on Holy Thursday to, to, to wash the feet of inmates, including two women and two Muslims. These gestures just come out of Pope Francis's personality and his own instincts. Mm -hmm. But we dare not forget, this is also a very savvy Jesuit politician. He knows what he's doing. Mm -hmm. uh, and he knows these gestures are recalibrating impressions of the church and they're also setting a new standard for leadership in the church. That is, everything Francis does isn't just about him. Mm -hmm. It's also about sending a message to other people in leadership positions in Catholicism that this is the kind of thing that you need to be doing. Is that one way to understand why Pope Francis is Pope Francis? Because uh, he is, a, like you said in your speech yesterday, you know, crafty, and you, you said it just now again, uh, crafty and shrewd Jesuit, a smart and savvy Jesuit politician. Oh, absolutely. I mean, what, one of the things we dare not forget about Jorge Mario Bergoglio is that he has been exercising authority in the Catholic Church his entire adult life. He was elected the provincial superior of the Jesuits in Argentina at the tender age of 36. Uh, he was in that position a good run of time. After a brief sabbatical, he becomes the coadjutor archbishop of Buenos Aires, and then for 15 years was the archbishop. He knows how to move the levers of power. Uh, and, and that was a very important ingredient in electing Bergoglio in the first place. Let's not forget that the conclave of 2013 was in some ways the most anti-establishment conclave of the last hundred years. In this case, not change in the teaching of the church, but change in the management uh, of the church. They had watched a series of debacles and meltdowns on the administrative level during the Benedict years, which of course reached a crescendo with the surreal Vatican leaks affair of 2012 that ended with the arrest of the Pope's own butler. I mean, for God's sake, the butler actually did it. You know, a, a team of Hollywood screenwriters could not have dreamed this up. And, and these guys were just sick to death of, of watching all of that, uh, and they wanted someone who could get his hands uh, around the administrative machinery of the Vatican and make sure that it served the mission of the church rather than getting in the way of the mission of the church. You, you wrote a book, a book, uh, 10 Things Pope Francis uh, Wants You to Know. There are three things there. Poor church for the poor, humility, stay close to the people. What is Francis trying to tell us here? Take the church out of the sacristy, like you were saying? 
Bergoglio's famous phrase is, the church has to get out of the sacristy and into the street. It has to meet people where they live and make the Christian message relevant uh, mm -hmm. in the context of their daily lives. Yeah. Fundamentally, he does not see himself as a CEO or a manager or a theologian or an intellectual. He sees himself as a missionary, missionary. and he wants okay. to lead a missionary church. Okay, so for him, it's not a matter of getting people to attend Mass or go to the church, but for the priests to go outside of the church, because that, that, that is a problem here in the Philippines. Well, listen, I mean, if you ask Pope Francis, would you like it if more people showed up for church on Sunday, I'm sure the answer no. would be yes. 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 However, if you ask, is, his, is the way he is assessing his own success by head counts of how many people cho show up at church on Sunday, I'm equally convinced the answer would be no. Mm -hmm. I think what he wants, his measure of success, is is the church reaching out? Is mm -hmm. the church in the street where people live? Yeah. Becoming, you know, he has this wonderful vision of the church as a field hospital, you know, this, this kind of military hospital where the wounds of humanity are cured. I think that's how he would understand the success or failure of his regime, is the mm -hmm. Catholic Church truly becoming the field hospital of the world. Mm -hmm. The bruised, the dirty. The broken, the hurting. When you say preferential option for the poor, you're talking about the theology of liberation. Mm -hmm. That was quite popular also here in, in Manila, in, in the Philippines. Um, in the Ateneo de Manila, we had... And we still do have a Theology of Liberation course. And then, well, I bring that up now because a few weeks back, wasn't Gustavo Gutierrez in, in Rome? And like, you yeah. know, the, the story was, oh, he was welcomed so enthusiastically, I mean. Yeah, I was there that night. And, and yeah. let me tell you, uh, you know, if you know anything at all about the mm -hmm. history of the conflict mm -hmm. between liberation theologians from Latin America and German-speaking doctrinal czars in the Vatican, mm -hmm. okay, the sight of Gustavo Gutierrez and Cardinal Gerhard Mueller standing there linked arm in arm in this Vatican hall you know, doing everything but giving one another a big, sloppy, wet kiss. Uh, I mean, it almost felt like the end of history. You know, it's like, <laughs> what else could possibly happen? Uh -huh. uh, but look, I but, mean, I, I think Bergoglio is one of those Latin American bishops who has sort of engineered a detente uh, mm -hmm. between officialdom and the liberation theologians. I think what we have now is a moderate consensus, okay, which is mm -hmm. if liberation theology means armed insurrection and it means Marxism, then the answer is no. no. Yeah. If liberation theology means the preferential option for the poor, that is yes. the church ought to be on the side of the poor, then the answer is yes. The faith must be proposed, not imposed. What does Francis mean by that? The church's notion now uh, is that the church must be relentlessly missionary. That is, it must always be offering the invitation to faith to people, but it also has to respect the, uh, the human dignity and therefore the freedom of conscience of all people to make a free decision for themselves whether they want to accept that invitation or not. What would you say is the greatest challenge for the church here in the Philippines? Well, first of all, I don't know if you want to be getting an assessment of Filipino <laughs> realities from an American. I've been here, you know, a little over 24 hours, so I'm yeah. not sure how well-versed I am. Yeah. But, but let me give you a kind of exterior perspective. Yes. Okay? I, I travel the Catholic world very widely, okay? I mean, I, I spend a good deal of my time in, in the Vatican and in Rome, but I also spend a good deal of time my, on the road, uh, you know, moving in Africa and other parts of Asia and Latin America and so on. My perspective uh, is that the Filipinos today mm -hmm. are the new Irish. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, in, in the 19th century, it was the Ireland that was generating these yeah. waves of immigrants moving all around the world mm -hmm. and carrying the Catholic faith with them, generating these hordes of missionary priests who would go to Africa and Asia and Latin America and kind of create new Catholic communities. Well, today, that role is being played by the Filipinos. There are mm -hmm. an estimated 10 million Filipinos living abroad. They tend to be vibrantly Catholic. I mean, I know many dioceses in the United States and Europe where mm -hmm. bishops will tell you that the most exciting and dynamic component of their local Catholic community is composed of the Filipinos. Mm -hmm. uh, the Catholic Church in many parts of the world is also increasingly reliant on Filipino priests. The truth of it is, there are a lot of parts of the Catholic map where if we had to send all those Filipinos home, we mm -hmm. might as well turn the lights out and, and go out of business. I mean, t take for example, mm -hmm. here's a very counterintuitive example. In the heart of the Islamic world, in Saudi Arabia today, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, there are an estimated 1.5 million Catholics, almost all of them foreign nationals who are working either in domestic services or in the oil industry. Of those 1.5 million Catholics, 1.2 million of them are Filipinos. It is basically mm -hmm. uh, a kind of wholly owned subsidiary of the Filipino church. 
Now, uh, first of all, what that tells me is that the rest of the Catholic Church owes an enormous debt of gratitude mm -hmm. to the Church in the, Phil in the Philippines today. Mm -hmm. Uh, secondly, what it tells me is that the church in the Philippines has an enormous responsibility. The decisions you are making right now about what your pastoral priorities are going to be, uh, you know, where you're going to invest your time and treasure, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, it has an effect here, but increasingly it has an effect all around the world because the Filipino footprint is now global. Mm -hmm. I mean, in many ways, the Filipinos, along with Indians and Nigerians and some other nationalities, but in particular the Filipinos, are the new missionaries and evangelists of 21st century Catholicism. Let me put it this way. As Filipino Catholicism rises or falls, so too will the Catholic Church rise or fall in this era. Uh, yesterday you talked about, well, you mentioned Cardinal Tagle, and then you said uh, well, he's a rock star in the way Pope Francis is to a certain extent. No? And then you also said that your article on Cardinal Tagle um, as one of the 22 uh, populists had the most number of hits, like 700,000. It wasn't actually an article. I, I oh. did. There's, there's a Catholic TV network in, in Canada called Salt and Light. Mm -hmm. And they had asked me to do these little, like, five-minute YouTube videos about different ah, okay. candidates. Yeah. Uh, and I think I did seven or eight of them. And most of them got, like, five, 6,000 hits. Okay, basically four cats and a dog were looking at these things. Whereas tagley has got, like, 700,000. It was astonishing. I kind of jokingly said that every Filipino Catholic in the world must be clicking on this thing at least once. Uh, you know, which illustrates the, the kind of global following that Cardinal Tagli has. Uh, I mean, obviously, he is beloved by Filipinos, uh, but increasingly, he's a point of reference uh, all around the world. I think particularly in English-speaking Catholicism, because his command of English is so good. Uh, and also in Italy, because his command of Italian is outstanding. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, in, and because of the vision he represents. In some ways, Tagli was Francis before Francis was Francis. I mean, the, this whole emphasis on a humbler, simpler church that is more in touch with the struggles of ordinary people, that puts the emphasis on mercy rather than judgment, that tries to project compassion and understanding, yeah. that gets out into the street. Right. I mean, as a Filipino, your question ought to be, where have I heard this before? Mm -hmm. Okay, because before you were hearing it from Bergoglio as Pope, you were hearing it from Tagli as Cardinal. In the last conclave, there was a lot of excitement here in the Philippines about Cardinal Tagle because, you know, people were saying, oh, my God, maybe, maybe the next pope will be Filipino. Maybe it's going to be Cardinal Tagle, you know. And um, when he came out on screen and everybody was watching, you know, that was early morning here in Manila, um, you know, there was a lot of, uh, you know, excitement. You know, people were really, really uh, uh, so happy to see him uh, on TV, you know, casting his vote, stuff like that, no? But then, of course, it, it didn't turn out that way. But is it ever going to happen, uh, you think, an Asian pope or me, maybe even a Filipino pope, maybe Tagle as pope or something? I'm not asking you to predict. Yeah, yeah, no. <laughs> hey, listen, this is what I do. Yeah. Uh, you know, is, is, are we ever going to see an Asian pope? I think mm -hmm. the answer to that question is clearly yes. Mm -hmm. uh, now, how quickly that's going to happen, I don't know. But, but one yeah. thing I will tell you. Uh, is that beginning with the election of John Paul II in 1978, I think that shattered the Italian monopoly on the papacy. Uh, and the election of Bergoglio in 2013 shattered the European monopoly on the papacy. I mean, today we are in a new era in which the Pope can come from any place. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, obviously, it is conceptually possible it could be an Asian, and it's conceptually possible it could be a Filipino. Now, uh, is it going to be Tagle? Look, I mean, pr trying to predict who the next pope is going to be is like trying to predict who's going to win the Masters golf tournament. I mean, mm -hmm. you can identify some favorites who are, like, credibly possible, but there's yeah. always somebody who could come from the back of the pack, you yeah. know, to, to win a surprise victory. So, you know, I, I don't know. What I will tell you uh, is that my contacts with cardinals from all around the world suggest to me uh, that, uh, that Togli carries enormous respect, uh, that people find him an extraordinarily impressive figure, uh, and that he would be on most cardinal short lists of someone they would look at seriously. That's mm -hmm. no prediction he's going to win. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a prediction that he will get a very serious look. But of course, one of the things that was, um, in a way, going against him uh, in this last conclave, but he was, he's very young. He's like, what, in his 50s? 56. He is 56, the fourth yeah. youngest cardinal in the world. Fourth youngest. So, uh, but it's interesting because uh, earlier you were saying, right, that uh, Benedict was uh, so old already. So, you know, there was that feeling that, oh, maybe we shouldn't elect an, a pope who's too old. And then here you have the extreme in a way, you know, a young, a young candidate. 
Well, you know, in the old days, age used to be considered a really important voting issue. The mm -hmm. idea is he didn't want a pope who was too old because that was going to mean a short and weak papacy. You didn't want a pope who was too young because that means you're going to be stuck with him forever. Mm -hmm. uh, but I actually think Benedict's resignation took age off the table as a voting issue. Mm -hmm. Because now we know that death is not the only realistic way for a papacy to end. It can also end in resignation. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you could roll the dice on an older candidate on the theory that, well, we would have an exit strategy if he gets sick. He can always mm -hmm. step aside and allow us to pick someone else. And you can roll the dice on a younger candidate because you could say, well, that guy could give us 10 years, yeah. and then he could step aside uh, and make way for someone to take over. Now, of course, you can't force popes to resign. Yeah. Canon law says it has to be a free decision. But, you know, realistically, you could imagine that that would be the thought process. Yeah. So I actually think age is now less relevant than it once mm -hmm. was. You know, I think, in, but, but age is relevant with Togli in this sense. Yeah. Uh, you know, okay, he didn't get elected in 2013. In a way, you can say, so what? I mean, you know, the last two popes were elected at the ages of 78 and 76, which means there are two more decades mm -hmm. uh, in which Luis Antonio Togli is a plausible candidate. He could theoretically be on the shopping list twice more. Mm -hmm. you know, before his career is over. So, you know, as we would say in Italian, pazienza, have some patience. <laughs> Where is Francis going to take the church in the next five to ten years? If, you know, he's still Pope by then. Where are we headed? I mean, what other surprising things are we going to see him do and say? Well, if there's one thing we've learned about Pope Francis at the one-year mark is that it is hazardous to your health to try to predict what he's going to do because <laughs> this guy is the ultimate maverick in many yeah. ways. But listen, I think the broad outlines of what he's trying to accomplish are fairly clear. Uh, I mean, at one level, he wants to engineer a serious structural reform of the Vatican to promote transparency and, and accountability, mm. to promote subject matter competence in, in key personnel positions, to sort of, in a way, you know, clean up some of the scandals that yeah. have proven an impediment to the Church's mission. You know, at another level, I think he's trying to redefine what leadership in the Catholic Church looks like. He wants to put the accent on service rather than power and privilege. Uh, he's trying to promote the social gospel, that is concern for the poor, concern for the environment, opposition to war and so on, to put that on a kind of level of rough equality with the church's per-life concerns. So I think these are all elements of his vision. But at the end of the day, you want to, when you get to the core of mm -hmm. what he's about, mm -hmm. I think the core of what this pope is about is that he sees himself as the pope of mercy. I mean, the commitment to mercy is literally his motto as Pope, okay? It, it was in his first homily as Pope. It's in his practice, how attached he is to the sacrament of confession. I, I think everything he's doing, from the nitty-gritty details of how do you restructure the Vatican Bank on up to, you know, what does the Vatican say about the persecution of Christians around the world, and on and on, I think all of it, at the end of the day, is designed to make sure that when the outside world looks at the Catholic Church, they see a community of mercy. I mean, listen, Francis understands he's a minister of the Christian gospel. He has to pronounce both God's judgment and God's mercy on a fallen world. But I think his belief is the world has heard our judgment with crystal clarity. And now it is time for them to hear and see and smell and taste our mercy. I guarantee you, when the last word on this papacy is written, he will be remembered as the Pope of Mercy. Mm -hmm. He's very popular, right? You think? Yeah, I mean, here in the Philippines, yes. Listen, I mean, it is a fact, okay, not a hunch or a theory. Yeah. It's an empirical fact that in every part of the world where public opinion can be scientifically measured, mm -hmm. this pope has approval ratings that politicians and celebrities would sacrifice their children to pagan gods to obtain. Okay, I mean, mm -hmm. he, he is the most popular figure on the planet. And, and it's not just the, the popularity of celebrity. I mean, it's mm -hmm. not the Justin Bieber or Lady Gaga kind yeah. of popularity. Yeah. I mean, what it is, I think, is that in many ways, Francis is the new Nelson Mandela. I mean, even outside the bounds of the Catholic Church, he's that new figure on the global stage mm -hmm. that people kind of universally agree is a towering moral authority, the, the person you look to, mm -hmm. you know, to find out what's on the side of angels and what isn't. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. When we come back, the church in our times and of our lives, when news.ph returns. The Philippines is the only predominantly Catholic country in this part of the world. In a very real sense, it sticks out like a sore thumb. We are Asian, but we are Western. 
our ancestors were reluctant Catholics, we are at once proud and troubled Catholics. Still in all, the Roman Catholic Church has made an indelible imprint in our lives. It is next to impossible to escape it. From birth to death, dust to dust, cradle to crypt. Cradle to crypt, dust to dust, birth to death. Such is the life of the Filipino Catholic fleshed out in the sacraments. There was a time when an infant needed a Christian name to be baptized. If the parents could not think of a proper Christian name, the de facto name would be that of the saint whose feast fell on that day. The Binyag was also known for the Pinoy pension for milking all the patronage out of it. Godfathers and godmothers are seen as padrinos literally. As a child reached school age, the challenge was to send him or her to an all-boys or all-girls Catholic school. Heaven forbid the child would go to a non-Catholic school because there the subject religion would not be taught. Day in and day out, classes began and ended with a prayer. Prayers that were memorized and taken to heart. Catholic schools offer First Holy Communion, First Confession, and Confirmation big school activities had holy masses built into them. Three o'clock in the afternoon is the hour of great mercy. You die, Jesus, that the source of life flowed At home, for everything souls, stopped for the hour the of great of mercy, mercy opened up for the whole and world. for the angelus at six o'clock in the evening. The family that prays together, after all, stays together. For marriage, a church wedding has to take place. The focus, though, is more on preparing for the wedding, not enough on the marriage. The more powerhouse the ninongs and ninangs are for the wedding, the better. In recent years, churches began to get the hang of it and now charge big amounts for weddings. In death, Catholic rites are practiced. Mass is said every day. A final blessing before burial, a must. The sacraments were meant to strengthen faith, but the danger is when they are seen as nothing more than rituals. In fact, there's a comment, uh, a very uh, famous comment, that sacraments are sacramentalized but not evangelized enough. In other words, uh, Catholics go through the motions of, uh, of, of, of having received the sacraments, like baptism and so on, but they don't they don't really understand the very spirit, uh, the, the very purpose of these sacraments. Evangelized means you understand your faith and you, you actively promote it, you know, and proclaim it and so on. Catholics, as he says, perform religious obligations and passively receive sacraments. What's been emphasized all these centuries is that grace received in a sacrament is sufficient. Sacraments do become effective and not only valid when we cooperate in the living out of our faith. So there's a difference between uh, what Catholics have, have come to practice as a, a brand of ritualism. No? By simply performing it validly and according to the minimum requirements of the ritual or the rite, that the grace is automatically received. God needs our human cooperation to make that grace personally effective in our lives. How unfortunate that, that, that Catholicism or Christianity has, has been reduced no? to, to that kind of, of, of mindset, no? that, that, that Christian life is simply a matter of avoiding sin and hell as, as much as possible. But you know, the Christ of the Gospels uh, be, uh, taught otherwise, no? that we should proclaim with love, with joy. No? Uh, and seek out the poor and change structures in society. Performing a rite for the sake of performing it is blind, empty ritualism. From, from, from an anthropological point of view, no, the ritual itself uh, must be symbolic of a deeper human value. Okay. So that it will mean something? Yeah, exactly. Uh, transition rituals, graduations, they mark they mark a, a, a change, no? a, uh, an evolution as it were, no? moving from one stage or phase of life to another.
the age. So for example, baptism marks the transition from, I mean, theologically, no, from darkness to light. There are rituals apart from the official sacraments of the church. Rituals such as devotions, a practice of full Catholicism, or a mix of both. It is a Christ who is about to be put to death that Filipinos identify with the most. Millions spill out onto the streets of Manila every January 9th for the Feast of the Black Nazarene. There is also the devotion to the Santo Niño, the Child Jesus. Devotions that have been criticized precisely for ritualism. The mindset is so long as I touch the robe or the rope, uh, then something mechanical could take place. So long as I do something, ergo, uh, some kind of favor is granted and so on. Now while on the one hand, Father Arevalo, the Dean of Filipino Theologians, would argue that this is precisely the way by which simple, uneducated people encounter you know, the Divine Presence and we should not be quick to judge. On the other hand, these kinds of devotions have been precisely criticized. People do not exhibit the kind of conversion that must be expected of someone who apparently has had a profound encounter with the Nazareno or even the, the Santo Niño. The season of Lent is to remember how Christ suffered. We put ash on our foreheads on Ash Wednesday, bring palm fronds to church on Palm Sunday, go on a visita iglesia on Monday Thursday, do the pabasa. On Good Friday, we do nothing, no eating, no bathing, watch Lenten movies of old like The Robe and Jesus of Nazareth. We flagellate ourselves, crucify ourselves, hoping the praxis is the same as the prayer. On Saturday, we attend the Easter Vigil Mass, and on Easter Sunday, Jesus rises from the dead and the church comes alive again. The next big event in the Catholic calendar is Advent and Christmas. The first, second, third, and fourth Sundays of Advent and Simbang Gabi. Christmas Eve Mass and the Noche Buena. New Year's Eve and the New Year's Eve Mass. The Fiesta, a celebration of a saint's feast day, stretches out to one whole day, a practice we picked up from the Spanish friars. Holy Mass on Sundays and on days of obligations. Fewer people attend Mass nowadays. In practice and on average, homely goes on for 20 minutes. Jesuits are taught to give eight-minute homilies. Otherwise, they're told, they will lose souls. Spain came to discover these islands to redeem, not lose souls. It was against this backdrop that a Portuguese explorer, who had transferred his allegiance to Spain, brought the Spanish crown and Catholicism to the Philippines. Exactly 493 years ago today, Ferdinand Magellan dropped anchor in the waters off Cebu. He presided over the baptism of a local chieftain, Raja Humabon, and then planted a wooden cross, presumably to save these God-forsaken islands. A week and a half later, Magellan was dead, killed in a battle with Lapu-Lapu. Forty years later, Intensive Christianization begins with the expedition led by Miguel López de Legazpi, a moment that fortified the Spaniards' resolve to stay and conquer the pagans, and they would do it in two ways, by force and by faith. And the rest, they say, is three centuries of colonial history, during which the real power rested in the Agustinians, Franciscans, and Dominicans with a stranglehold on Luzon, and the Jesuits and the Recollects were the Visayas and Mindanao to themselves. Reform did come, though, with secularization, but it doomed many. A contribution, though, that the religious orders made to the Philippines was education. One way to evangelize, after all, was to educate. 
The other great contribution were the churches the friars built in the very heart of each major town. Now known as heritage churches, they are as much tourist attractions as they are places of worship. By the mid-1800s, the friars had succeeded in converting much of the population to Christianity. The proof was the regular and pious attendance at Sunday Mass. The church in the Philippines has had many challenges to deal with its Spanish past and its Filipino present. But struggle has a way of purifying, whether it was the years under a dictatorship or through opposition to some of its teachings. In 1861, the parish priest of the little-known town of Tangalan in what is now the province of Aklan began to build this church. The priest, Padre Leon Pedrosa Miraflores, is buried here. His tombstone reads, Tus parientes no te olvidan. Your relatives will never forget you. The priest had at least seven women who gave him many children. All but one of the women daughters of the landed and influential families from the town he was assigned to. Padre Leon, however, was not a Spanish friar. He was a Filipino priest. The abuse by the Spanish friars was so eloquently captured in José Rizal's brave novels, The Noli Mitangere and The El Filibusterismo. Padre Damaso was a main character in the Noli, the embodiment of all that was evil about Spanish Catholicism and the most loathed, that when the irreverent Carlos Celdran held up a poster bearing that dreaded name at an ecumenical event at the Manila Cathedral in late 2010, the church was mortified and offended. Celdran wanted the church to stop meddling the government's reproductive health stands. Celdran was charged with offending religious feelings, a little-known crime that was tucked away in the revised penal code. Celdran spent a few hours in jail. This January, the judge convicted him to a minimum of two months in jail. Celdran is appealing the decision to the court and to the Pope via Twitter. Flashback to the 50s when Filipino high school students were forced to read about Padre Damaso in the Noli by a law that Congress passed. The law was meant to turn young Filipinos into patriotic citizens. All it succeeded in doing was getting the Catholic Church angry. The Church pulled out all the stops to block the implementation of the law. It did not succeed. Neither did it succeed some 60 years later, when Congress passed a reproductive health law in December 2012. In the elections the following year, the Church upped the ante and actively campaigned against candidates who advocated a reproductive health law. In an interview in August last year, Pope Francis was quoted as saying, We cannot insist only on issues related to abortion, gay marriage, and the use of contraceptive methods. We have to find a new balance, he said. Otherwise, even the moral edifice of the Church is likely to fall like a house of cards. Just last week, the Supreme Court said the law, save for a few provisions, was constitutional. Theology professor and ex-seminarian Dr. Mike Assis. Is this the first time in history that uh, people openly and publicly stand up to, to, to the church and what it believes? So it's a, I think it's a very humbling time now for the church. It's, uh, some say uh, it, it proves some kind of uh, failure on the, on, the, on the part of the church to convince the majority about the morality or immorality of contraceptive, uh, contraceptive uh, methods. It's a church that is more challenged to, be, to listen more, challenged to dialogue more, to look within itself, you know, reflect on what it has to do so that it can become a credible voice among many other voices in, in society. John XXIII, who was Pope from 1958 to 1963, called for the Second Vatican Council that began in October 1962. Vatican II was a gathering of bishops from all over the world that set the Church on a course of reform and altered the landscape. The call, among many others, was for the Church to be relentlessly missionary, but to be respectful of freedom and human dignity, and to show mercy. 
If Vatican II was for the universal church, the Philippines had its own version. The Second Plenary Council of the Philippines held in early 1991 was a clarion call for renewing the church in the Philippines. What emerged from this local Vatican II was, among other things, that the church should be a church for the poor. So that early, you know, in the 90s, we were talking about a church that has to be more humble, more simple, that is not uh, obsessed with uh, the things that, that the world cherishes the most. No? I mean, of course, uh, world, uh, wealth, fame, and power. The same uh, message that, that Pope Francis now uh, exhorts no? all Catholics all over the world. The timing of the Second Plenary Council could not have been better. The country was rebuilding institutions after emerging from a dictatorship. In the 1970s and the early 1980s, it was not in vogue to show opposition to Marcos. So the church, like the rest of society, lay low. I've heard of uh, priests of various religious orders you know, who went underground, okay? Because they were hounded like, uh, like fugitives. On the other hand, um, certainly there are very shrewd uh, politicians, even among the uh, church hierarchy, who had what we call a, a critical kind of collaboration with the regime, if only to protect us, the, the well-being of some clerics. The church indeed struggled with and mirrored the times. <laughs> The shot that rang out on August 21, 1983, not only forced people out into the streets, it also forced the church to find its voice. In the aftermath of the February 1986 snap elections, My dear people, I wish you to pray. This is Cardinal Sin speaking to the people. When people power massed at EDSA in February 1986, Nuns on their knees clutching their rosaries were sometimes the only thing that stood between the tanks and the throngs. The church would come out again in full force when rallies were held to protest both Fidel Ramos's and Joseph Estrada's plans to amend the Constitution. And again at Edsa Dos to unseat a president the church didn't exactly approve of. But this same flock of some 85 million Filipino Catholics that can be rallied against corruption, charter change, or a president cannot be influenced to vote for or against a particular candidate. The bishops have never openly endorsed a candidate for president or vice president, choosing only to give guidelines as to determine a candidate's moral uprightness to get elected to office. But the church did go as far as campaigning against a candidate for senator in 1995. The very popular Juan Flavier, who as FBR's health secretary, was so pro-family planning it earned him the ire of the bishops. The church didn't succeed in making Flavier lose, but he didn't top the senatorial race either. The church did its best against Estrada in 1998 too. But Era para sa Mahihirap was too popular with the masses, no matter how devoutly Catholic they were. The church during the Arroyo administration was quiet at times, breaking its silence at least once in the aftermath of allegations Mrs. Arroyo cheated in the 2004 elections. It called for truth and accountability. It was unfortunate, though, the administration bowed out, leaving a cloud of doubt hanging over the heads of some bishops who had accepted sports utility vehicles from the Philippine Charity Sweepstakes Office. The Church in the Philippines has mirrored the times. In spite of the many challenges the Catholic Church here and around the world face, many believe it is still the best time to be Catholic. And that's because of one man. Pope Francis. Vatican journalist John Allen Jr. profiled 22 candidates for Pope for the last conclave. One of them was Jorge Mario Bergoglio, who many thought was too old, too obscure, and whose time had come and gone in 2005 when he was runner-up to Benedict. Well, I actually think the initial reaction was to the name Francis, mm -hmm. because that was in some ways a truly astonishing choice. I mean, aside from the fact that I had interviewed church historians in the past who had sworn until they were blue in the face,
that there could never be a Pope Francis. Because they would argue that just as there could never be a Pope Jesus or another Pope Peter, because these are singular and unrepeatable figures. So it was, it was surprising on that level, but even more. I mean, that, you know, when, when you take the name Francis, you are setting the bar awfully high for yourself. I mean, Francis is an iconic figure in the Catholic imagination. You better be able to walk the talk. Uh, and so it was a pretty bold selection. It was, in effect, a whole program of governance and miniature. I think after that, then we started to ask the question, who is this man that, that had the courage uh, and the boldness, you know, to take this name for himself? Not since John Paul II has a pope been this popular and beloved. The world mourned his death in 2005. On April 27, alongside John XXIII, John Paul II will be canonized by Pope Francis, who has literally and figuratively taken the world by storm like no other pope, like no other world leader. This is, a good, this is the best thing to be Catholic now <laughs> because of the pope. Pope Francis was the Jesuits' provincial superior in Argentina before becoming archbishop of one of the world's largest archdioceses for 15 years. He lived in a rundown Spartan apartment and spent much time in the slums of Buenos Aires. He was, and is, John Allen says, a bishop of the poor. His decision to spurn the cavernous papal apartment and to stay in room 201 of the Doma Santa Marta, the hotel on Vatican grounds where he lived during the conclave, to go back to the Casa del Clero, which is a kind of a hotel for priests in Rome, and pack his own bag and pay his own bill. You know, calling his newspaper delivery guy in Buenos Aires and saying, hey, I'm not going to need the paper anymore. I mean, what all of this told us uh, is that, yeah, he may have reached the world's loftiest spiritual office, but he remains an ordinary guy who is not drunk on his own image or his own power. So he came at the right time for the church. I would say that Francis came along at a moment when the Catholic Church in many ways, at least in the court of public opinion, was at a low ebb. I mean, at the end of the Benedict years, the dominant narratives about the Catholic Church, child sexual abuse scandals and Vatican meltdowns, crisis at the Vatican Bank, the dominant narrative today is rock star pope takes the world by storm. Uh, and in that sense, Francis clearly has given the Church a, a new lease on life. That new lease on life has gotten even longer with every masterstroke Pope Francis makes, including the latest when he insisted on going to confession before giving confession himself. You know, going to uh, a youth prison in Rome on Holy Thursday to, to, to wash the feet of inmates, including two women and two Muslims. These gestures just come out of Pope Francis's personality and his own instincts. But we dare not forget, this is also a very savvy Jesuit politician. He knows what he's doing. Uh, and he knows these gestures are recalibrating impressions of the church, and they're also setting a new standard for leadership in the church. That is, everything Francis does isn't just about him. Allen believes the cardinals knew exactly what they were doing and exactly what they were getting into by electing Bergoglio in the conclave. So let's not forget that the conclave of 2013 was in some ways the most anti-establishment conclave of the last hundred years. You'd have to go back to 1914 to find another time the cardinals so clearly understood themselves to be voting for a change. They had watched a series of debacles and meltdowns on the administrative level during the Benedict years of the church, and they wanted someone who could get his hands uh, around the administrative machinery of the Vatican and make sure that it served the mission of the church rather than getting in the way of the mission of the church. As Cardinal Bergoglio, Pope Francis never stopped making the call for a more missionary church. Bergoglio's famous phrase is, the church has to get out of the sacristy and into the street. It has to meet people where they live and make the Christian message relevant uh, in the context of their daily lives. He sees himself as a missionary and he wants to lead a missionary church. And so we ask the question, does it matter to Pope Francis that there are less and less people who come to Sunday Mass? Well, listen, I mean, if you ask Pope Francis, would you like it if more people showed up for church on Sunday, I'm sure the answer would be yes. However, if you ask, is, his, is the way he is assessing his own success by head counts of how many people show up at church on Sunday, I'm equally convinced the answer would be no. 
I think what he wants, his measure of success, he has this wonderful vision of the church as a field hospital, you know, this, this kind of military hospital where the wounds of humanity are cured. I think all of it, at the end of the day, is designed to make sure that when the outside world looks at the Catholic Church, they see a community of mercy. I mean, listen, Francis understands he's a minister of the Christian gospel. He has to pronounce both God's judgment and God's mercy on a fallen world. But I think his belief is the world has heard our judgment with crystal clarity. And now it is time for them to hear and see and smell and taste our mercy. Guarantee you, when the last word on this papacy is written, he will be remembered as the Pope of Mercy. Sino man ang nabubuhay para sa sarili lamang. You may not know the name of the man who composed this and over 400 other mass songs, but his songs you know. Sung in chapels and churches in the Philippines, and yes, even in cathedrals the world over. In 1965, in line with the Vatican II edict to de-Latinize the Mass and allow the congregation to participate in it, a Filipino Jesuit began to compose songs. He once said that he needed to write songs that the ordinary man, woman or child on the street could sing. St. Augustine had said after all, to sing is to pray twice. The Mass had never been sang before this. Wherever Filipinos gather for worship, it is the hymns of Father Eduardo Ontiveros we sing. My perspective uh, is that the Filipinos today are the new Irish. Uh, you know, in, in the 19th century, it was the Ireland that was generating these waves of immigrants moving all around the world and carrying the Catholic faith with them, generating these hordes of missionary priests who would go to Africa and Asia and Latin America and kind of create new Catholic communities. Well, today that role is being played by the Filipinos. I mean, I know many dioceses in the United States and Europe where bishops will tell you that the most exciting and dynamic component of their local Catholic community is composed of the Filipinos. There are a lot of parts of the Catholic map where if we had to send all those Filipinos home, we might as well turn the lights out and, and go out of business. Let me put it this way. As Filipino Catholicism rises or falls, so too will the Catholic Church rise or fall in this era. Alan did this video on Tagle as a papabile in the run-up to the last conclave. And most of them got like five, six thousand hits, okay? Basically four cats and a dog were looking at these things. Whereas Tagli's got like 700,000, uh, you know, which illustrates the, the kind of global following that Cardinal Tagli has in some ways. Tagli was Francis before Francis was Francis. I mean, the, this whole emphasis on a humbler, simpler church. I mean, as a Filipino, your question ought to be, where have I heard this before? Okay, because before you were hearing it from Bergoglio as Pope, you were hearing it from Tagli as Cardinal. So can you say, we asked, that the next pope could be Asian? Yes, was Alan's reply, but when is anybody's guess? And what about a Filipino pope? What I will tell you uh, is that my contacts with cardinals from all around the world suggest to me uh, that, uh, that Togli carries enormous respect, uh, that people find him an extraordinarily impressive figure, uh, and that he would be on most cardinal short lists of someone they would look at seriously. That's no prediction he's going to win. Uh, it is a prediction that he will get a very serious look. Mike Assis, the Filipino theologian, doesn't want to get our hopes up. There's always a jinx on cardinals who are presumed to be strong candidates for Pope going into a conclave, but he says... Chito Tagle will be a great symbol of hope no, for Asia no, and for the church that is poor no, because he comes from a lowly, restless, divided nation, no, always thirsting and hungering for some kind of redemption.
That's our Holy Week presentation. I'm Pia Ontiveros. This is News.ph. Thank you for joining us. See you again next Wednesday. Good night.